All right, so I just saw a video by Numberphile on Bertrand's Paradox, <clears throat> which is regarding um, the distribution of, the probabilistic distribution of chords through a circle. And I will link to that video. Um, the problem is, depending on the method that you choose to... Hello, focus. What the hell just happened? Come on, camera. Hello. Jesus. The method that you choose to uh, use changes, has different probabilities. So um, what I'm going to do is show that one of them is actually correct, and the other two are actually sleight-of-hand magic tricks that have mistakes built into them. All right, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to make a circle. So I, you probably can't see that because the camera is blurry as hell, does not want to focus, but I just put a point on the paper, that is going to be my center point, I haven't used this compass in a while, it's a little dusty. Alright, so, let's make a circle. And again, you probably can't see that, but I'm going to cut it out so you'll be able to see it just fine in a second. Like most of that waste off of there. And gravity always wins in the end. Here we go. Let's see. So let's cut this out carefully now. Okay. So the. Uh, the question being asked here is, what is the probability, or, um, yeah, what is the probability of a any chord drawn across the circle um, being longer than the side length of an equilateral triangle inscribed within the circle? And if we just pick... Um, if we pick a specific point on the circle to start our chord from, then the probability of the other point um, being one which draws a chord across the circle that's longer than the side length of the equilateral triangle will be one-third. So two-thirds of the time it will be shorter. And then another way is to divide up the area of the circle so that you have an inscribed circle inside the equilateral triangle. The area of that is one quarter of the total area, so it is the probability of your chord passing through there, according to this, is one quarter. This one obviously has problems because when you actually run a program that does this, you can see that there's sort of an empty patch in the center. Like, it's clearly wrong. And then another way um, looks at the radius, considers the fact that if we're only considering chords perpendicular to the radius and we just allow random position along the radius, well now we get a distribution of one half. Uh, my contention is that this is actually the correct one and we don't have to use any crazy magic to discern this. It's really quite obvious that this is the correct one. So I'm going to make our equilateral triangle. The easy way to do this, cut out a circle, fold a point on the edge to the center, and then do that as many times as you can. Turns out the number of times you can do that is three. Because that's how we get our equilateral triangle. Those three times are going to give us... There's our equilateral triangle inscribed within our circle. Origami is the shit. Okay, so... Let me... Let me draw these lines in a little more clearly. Oh, white is on the wrong side here. 
Right. Now I can actually see what I'm doing. Turn you bastard. So um, I'm actually doing this more precisely than um, what is it? Three blue, one brown, whatever. Whatever his name is. He, he certainly knows a lot more than I do, but I think in this case, uh, he was very wrong. And I'm certainly doing this more accurately than he was. Um, like, totally have respect for him. He, he knows way the hell more about math and shit than I do. But there are times where I'm like, dude, I, you are not looking at this correctly. And I'm really surprised at how, how you're looking at this. Okay, so there we have... Does this, does this just blow it out? Yes. What about this? Hey, there we go. Nice and clear. How about now? Does that help? Not really. Okay. Alright, so there is our circle with an inscribed equilateral triangle. And you have your center. So, what I my contention is is the correct way to look at this is what we need to be looking at a line perpendicular a radius perpendicular to one of these edges because the triangle and the circle have different rotational symmetries so looking at that inscribed circle we're only using the rotational symmetries of the circle and we're ignoring the the, or the rotational sy symmetries of the triangle and that is causing the problem <laughs> and that's and that's why we're getting the one quarter because it, it, it's wrong for that reason because we're looking at the rotational symmetry of the circle and thus only the relative area of these two regions the the inscribed circle and the circ uh, circumscribed circle now let me draw that inscribed circle real quick so you can actually see what I'm talking about And that doesn't, there's no way that shows up. So here's our circumscribed circle, or our inside inscribed circle. Some prefix scribe. I can't see shit in the shadow. There we go. So it's like this. There we go. Okay. So, the area of this inscribed circle is tiny compared to the area of the circumscribed circle. Right? It's So, the probability of your line, um, if we're looking at the areas, the, the line crossing through here is one quarter. But I think visually, just looking at this, that doesn't make sense. And when you run an ex uh, like a computer experiment where you just do it like a thousand times, ten thousand times, a billion times, whatever, you can see that you end up with a much lower density here in the center. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a hole, basically, in the center. It, it becomes very dense out here and much less dense in here. So there's clearly something wrong with this. And I think the, the intuitive way is we're ignoring the rotational symmetry of the triangle entirely, and we're looking only at the rotational symmetries of the circle. So, and, and that's what's causing the problem. <coughs> um, and by ignoring the triangle, we're just getting the ratio of the areas between these two circles. Um, and that is determining our fraction, our probability. The other method, which chooses one point, and then the other one is random. This one sort of has the opposite problem. We're only here, we're only looking at the rotational symmetries of the triangle. And that's what's giving us a 
two-thirds chance of a short edge and a one-third chance of a long edge because we're only looking at the triangle. So it's sort of the flipped, the opposite problem. What we should do is, so the triangle has um, this threefold rotational symmetry. The circle has an infinite rotational symmetry. What we need to do is set all that shit aside, pick just one, just one. Um, so what we need to do is just pick one side and then look at the circle and the triangle and how they interact with each other with respect to just one side. Okay. So what we have now is this one side that we're looking at and what we want to know is what is the probability of a line parallel with that side ending up over here versus over here. And if it's over here, it's going to be longer than this side. If it's over here, it's going to be shorter than this side. Well, obviously, this is split in half because that's how I found this line in the first place. I literally just folded it in half. So, it's, it's going to be 50-50. This is the correct answer because it's the only one that <clears throat> deals with the incommensurate rotational symmetries of the triangle and the, and the circle. It's the only one that does this. The other two, um, you have a problem. When you're getting one third, you're really only considering the triangle and not the circle. And when you're getting one quarter, you're throwing away the triangle and only considering the circles. Also, this, this one quarter answer, what it is, is it's the one half answer viewed incorrectly because what we're doing is we're taking that one half answer and we're just rotating it around we're ignoring the, the fact that the triangle doesn't have th this infinite rotational symmetry so we're taking the one half answer and we're just translating it all we're rotating it all the way around and that's why it's wrong you're getting because now we've what we've done is we've taken a length and we translated it into an area. We squared it. That's why you're going from one half to a quarter. It's wrong for that reason. And you can see that it's wrong when you run, when you run a trial, when you run an experiment, and you see that there's a pocket in the center. There's a hole in the center. I don't understand why this is hard to hard for people to see. I don't understand why. Apparently, at least according to number file, nobody knows what the hell the correct answer is. I, this is not that complicated. I don't understand why this is confusing. Um, but apparently it is. I feel like the answer is really simple. In the video, what they do is the, he notes that, well, this answer, the one-half answer that I'm telling you is the correct answer, it appears to be correct because of this thing, this translational symmetry and scaling symmetry that you get if you just lay down a bunch of lines and use the circle as like a little window over those lines, like it, it works. It's the only one that works, but that's a bad reason to assume that it's true. And I agree that is a bad reason to assume that it's true, but it is true because the one half is correct. The one half is not correct because that's true. It's the other way around. And apparently the only work that's been done on this is to demonstrate that the translational symmetry thing, the um, translational invariance, that's, that's what they call translational invariance is true, and thus the one half is correct. No, that's the wrong way to look at this. Actually looking at what the hell you're doing with the problem gives you that one half is the answer, and the translational invariance is a consequence of that being the correct answer. Anyway.